All right, everybody, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and today's sermon is entitled, The End of the Church Age. That's right, The End of the Church Age. I believe we're getting very close to that right now. The End of the Church Age, The Great Reset. The Great Reset. Now, my reset might be a little bit different than your reset. I don't know if you've heard this, but all over the internet and uh, videos people send me, and everyone's talking about The Great Reset, The Great Reset. And I don't really want to talk about that that much, but in the Bible we see God doing resets over and over and over. And it seems like there's a theme in the Bible of things going good for a little while, then they go bad, and then they have to start over, and then start over, and then start over. And that's called dispensation. So I went ahead and drew up here the dispensations in the Bible and how every one ends in a certain way. And that's why there has to be another reset, another starting over. <laughs> and you know whose fault it is? It's always man's fault, not God's fault. It's always man that's messing things up. So let's start today in Isaiah chapter 41. And I want to talk about the end of the church age. I believe we're very close to the rapture. And I'm not the only one. A lot of people are looking at this year and even this very month of September thinking, wow, this could be it. This could be it. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it isn't. I'm hoping that it could be. And wouldn't that be great? That would be our great reset as we go up to heaven at the rapture, we who are saved. But I want to um, go to the Bible and show you some things real quick in the scriptures. Then I want to show you this dispensational teaching real quick and show you uh, what the Bible teaches because it gives us an idea of what's going to happen next. If you read your Bible, do you realize you, you can know what's about to happen next? You can literally know the future if you read the Bible. Because the Bible is a book of prophecy and it tells us what's going to happen. So I've got three passages here in the book of Isaiah that I'd like you to read with me. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 22. Now in this chapter, Isaiah 41, 22, God is talking to Israel... And uh, he's asking them, you know, about their idols. And he's like, so do your idols do this? Do your idols do that? <laughs> and he's very careful to tell them, no, 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 I am God. I am your God, verse 10, not idols. And then in verse 22, look what he says, Isaiah 41, 22. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Okay, why don't you bring forth your idols and let them prophesy and tell us what's going to happen. Well, they don't. They're dumb idols, the Bible says. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things, what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. What an odd passage of Scripture. It says by knowing the former things, they point to the things to come. Interesting. So by knowing the past, you can know the future. That's what it's saying. Now, let's go to Isaiah 42 and verse 9. Isaiah 42, 9. Now, verse 8 again, he says, I am the Lord, neither my praise to graven images. He says, look, I want the glory, I need the praise. Don't give praise to idols or graven images because I am the true Lord. I am the Lord. But verse 9 says, Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. God says, before things happen, if you go to this book, the Bible, you'll see that I prophesied of what's going to happen. And if you would just listen to my words, then you'll know what's going to take place. Well, today they're all talking about the Great Reset, and their plan is to bring in their Great Reset and change all of society and change everything into the way they want it to be. And you know what? They're going to get it. They're, it's going to happen. Because the Bible shows us exactly what that is and how that's going to come to pass. So we see that and we know that. Now hold on a second here. I need to get some glasses here because these blue lights always bother me. Amen. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 9 and 10. Isaiah 46 verse 9 and 10. And let's look at that. These are the three passages in Isaiah that I want to begin with today. Isaiah 46 and verse 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Okay? This is the true God. Now look at verse 10. What does God do? Verse 10 says, declaring the end from the beginning, 
And from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So God says he declares the end from the beginning. And if you'll look back at ancient times and how things happened, that will give you a lot of clues of what are going to happen in the end times. That's amazing. God declares the end from the beginning. The Bible is a book of prophecy. Question, do you read it? Have you ever read the Bible all the way through? Just asking. I mean, maybe you should. If you did, you know what's going to happen next. You could look at this world of uncertainty, and boy, I tell you, I get emails, phone calls all the time. People, I'm so uh, distressed. I don't know what's going to happen. The world seems to be nuts. And uh, What is going on? And I'm like, oh, you're not reading your Bible, are you? Because if you read your Bible, you know exactly what's going on and what exactly is about to take place in this world. Let's go to Ecclesiastes real quick. And let me read this to you. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 9 and 10 says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there's no new thing under the sun. <laughs> it's, not, it's a cycle. It, it's a repeating cycle of what it was once is what it's going to be like again. And that happens all throughout history. The old saying is, the only thing that men never learn from history is that men never learn from history. But if you study history, you see that. Same thing happens over and over and over. And, and it's a cycle because people don't learn. So it says, the thing that hath been... It is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Verse 10, is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It says, it hath been already of old time which was before us. So history repeats itself. And the history of man is the history of man's falling. They always seem to get it right at the first and start out right, but then they always fall. Then they have to start over. And then they go good for a little while, then they fall, and they have to start over. Case in point, dispensations. I am a King James Bible believer, and I am a believer in dispensations in the Bible. And you go to the Bible and you look at the dispensations. I just went ahead and, and drew them up here for you to show you case in point. It's very hard to study the Bible without studying dispensations because it helps you so much to understand the Bible. And what does the teaching of dispensations teach us? That man always seems to fall into sin and then God has to send some judgment. And then, reset, start over. <laughs> so, the Edenic. Here's Adam and Eve. I forgot to write up here the names. Here's Adam and Eve. Well, Adam and Eve started out in a perfect world, in a perfect environment. Everything was great. All they had to do was obey that one command of God and don't eat of that tree. What did they do? They ate of the tree. They fell. And what did God do? He sent the curse and death. For by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So we get the judgment of God because of the fall of man. Well, then we have the antediluvial dispensation, an age of conscience, where people follow their conscience. The most well-known guy there, you know, would be Noah, old Noah, right? And people followed their conscience before the flood. But then the Bible says the thoughts of men were evil continually. Men fell so headlong into evil and wickedness and sin and God said, okay, I've got to send judgment, the flood. Do you see the repeating pattern? Men keep falling into sin. They keep falling, and God has to send judgment and start it over. Hit the reset button. Well, after Noah, we have this time of human government, the post-diluvial dispensation. We have a guy named Nimrod who starts his own world government. Now, of course, it's not a good one <laughs> because he tries to kick God out. And what do they do in that time? They build a tower. And they say, we want to build this tower into heaven. What were they thinking? What was their reason for doing that? They wanted to get up there and kick God out and say, we want to be gods. Well, that sounds like what the devil tricked Adam and Eve with. You shall be as gods. We want to do our thing, and we don't want God telling us what to do. So we're going to build a tower up there, and we're going to get rid of God and do our thing. That's a falling into sin. And guess what? The judgment was the confusion of the languages. God said, okay, you guys, boop, reset. <laughs> you got to confuse the languages. Now they separate. Now we'll start over with another dispensation. And 
things started to go okay, we had this real famous fella named Abraham. And Abraham, God changed his name to Abraham. It was Abram. But God said, Abraham, I'm going to call you and make a mighty nation of you. And then we have the patriarchal dispensation. And we have uh, how it's about the 12 tribes. It's about family. How did that work out? Well, Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had the 12 tribes. And the 12 tribes just had more kids and more kids. And before you knew it, there was like a million of them. And there were so many of them. And what did they do? They turned against God and fell into sin. And the judgment of God was putting them into captivity in Egypt as slaves for about 400 years to the Egyptians. Do you see a recurring theme here? Each dispensation, they start out pretty good. God starts out with a person that, that he's called. And then they end up falling into sin. What happened next? Well, we have a guy named Moses. And Moses comes along, and God uses Moses as the deliverer to deliver them out of Egypt, and then sets up the dispensation of the law, the legal dispensation, in which God is using Israel and giving that nation the law. How does that work out? Well, guess what? The law was the schoolmaster to bring them to Christ, and the plan was so that the Messiah could come, so that Jesus, God manifest in the flesh, could come down with his people. And he wanted him to follow the law because the law was supposed to be the schoolmaster to bring him to Christ. And guess what? He shows up exactly according to the prophecy of Daniel, of when he said he would show up. And what do they do? They crucify him. They rejected their Messiah because of the sin of the Pharisees. The Pharisees outwardly tried to appear to be so godly and good, yet they were so sinful and wicked inwardly. And Jesus called them out said, you bunch of hypocrites, you, you vipers, you this, you that. They rejected the Messiah, so God's judgment fell, and the nation of Israel was dispersed. All the Jews were dispersed for the next almost 2,000 years all over the planet in the destruction of Jerusalem. Reset, reset, reset. Well, here we go. We got a reset. We got the apostles going out. And the apostles are out there preaching. And the apostles, and of course Paul the apostle. And you know, this is all about Jesus. So it's all about Jesus. And then you have the church age. And for the last almost 2,000 years, what a wonderful time to live, the age of grace. When we have liberty and freedom and grace. And so what a great time because people can get saved by faith alone, not of works. But how does that end up? <laughs> Doesn't end up too good. 2 Thessalonians tells us. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us that the church age is going to end in a falling away. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, the day of the rapture, except there be a falling away first. So that's the apostasy, the falling away. And what is the judgment? Well, it's sinfulness and apathy. People today aren't interested in Jesus and God and the Bible and getting saved. Many of them claim to be part of the church. They don't even preach the gospel anymore. So there's going to be a judgment coming during the tribulation period. A lot of judgment. But it's going to start a new dispensation. And the rapture is where the church gets out. Thank God. And then comes the judgment. And then comes the guy named the Antichrist, the AC. And in this time period, this is where the world is building their one world government, in which one man will rule over the entire planet, and that will be the man of sin, who later will be the son of perdition. And so a lot of people call this globalization or global government. Some people even call it the New World Order or something like that. But this is the goal of the modern Great Reset. They want to reset the world in which everybody has to come together and all be equal under the Antichrist system. So in the Bible, this is prophesied, and we are seeing it come to pass today. We are seeing this push of the United Nations wanting to take over, and with their Agenda 21 and Agenda 30. And If you've ever studied the United Nations and their agendas, their plan is to bring about a one-world global government. I read the Economic World Forum, I think it is, or something like that, and I was looking at all this, and, 
and they talked about the Great Reset. So you can study, you can go to YouTube and look up the term, the Great Reset, and see what they're talking about. And it really has a lot to do with economics and how uh, they want to bring in an economic one-world system. And we'll get to that here in a minute. But how does that end? How does that all end for them? I believe the tribulation is seven years. The end of that seven years, well, it all falls into sin because the Antichrist takes complete control of the world and makes all people worship the dragon. The dragon, of course, would be Satan. So the whole world falls into sin and so far against God that they fall into the worship of Satan. Worldwide Luciferianism, worldwide following or worshiping of Satan. Well, what happens there? Well, the judgment of God is the battle of Armageddon where he destroys the Antichrist in a battle. And God has to one more time hit the reset button because of man falling into sin. And boy, did they fall into sin. This is like the worst. The whole world rejects Jesus and falls into the worship of the dragon. Those that say, I'd rather have Jesus, well, they're killed. They're beheaded during this time. So the whole world falls into Satan worship. Well, then you got your reset, and you've got the messianic. You've got Jesus coming back in his kingdom. And we would call this the millennial kingdom. And so we have the millennial kingdom of Christ. And what happens here? For a thousand years, Jesus Christ rules according to the Bible. And at the end of that thousand years... If you read the book of Revelation, there will be some people that say, Oh, what an oppressor. <laughs> oh, how awful. And they're angry at God, and they say, We don't want you to rule anymore. And the Bible says that the devil is put into a pit for a thousand years, and God lets him out at the end of that thousand years. And he'll deceive these people that don't like God anyway. And then comes the destruction of the entire earth. And then God destroys everything, then there's a new heaven and a new earth. So all this is in the Bible if you read the Bible. And this is why I believe in dispensations, because there are dispensations in the Bible. And dispensations teach us how man has a tendency to fall into sin, and that's what happens. So where are we here on this timeline? Well, we're about right here. We're at the end of the church age where it's about to change. And we're in this time of apostasy. So we're very close to the rapture. So we're very close to the world's great reset because the world's desire is to bring in this kingdom and usher in the kingdom of the Antichrist. And that's their goal. And that's what they want to do. And we're seeing them do that in our day. They're already forming it. And there, so many people email me all the time, I just can't believe the way the world's headed. And man, we're seeing it come to pass just the way the Bible said. And that's what's happening. So we are here at this time of apostasy. This is the fall of humanity. Humanity is falling away from God in the Bible. There was a time when society followed the Bible. The Bible had gone around the world and saturated society that most people wanted to live a moral life and follow the teachings of the Bible. But in the world we live today, many people are away from God in the Bible, and many people have fallen away. What does apostasy mean? The word apostasy means a falling away from a standing position. You know, the old saying is, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Well, in the world we live today, I don't know if you see it, but I see there's a lot of people that are not standing for anything. They're just falling for anything. There's so much apostasy. There's so much uh, false doctrine and false teachings. And so no one is standing. But what God told us to do, he said, stand. Well, how about you? If you will claim to be a Christian, are you standing? You see, a lot of folks today that claim to be Christians are not standing. And they're a bunch of pushovers. And they're allowing the Antichrist system to come in because they're not preaching against it. I find that interesting. But do you know how many times the Bible says to stand? Let's just read a couple verses about stand. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Well, a lot of people that claim to be Christians, they're not strong in the Lord. They have fallen away from the Lord. They don't read their Bibles. They say they're Christians with their mouths, but many don't even go to church or witness or, or, or do anything. They're just very worldly. They've fallen away. It's the falling away. It's the end of our dispensation. And it's Every dispensation ends in people falling into sin. And we're seeing that. We're seeing people falling headlong into sin. And it's sad. 
it's very sad to see. But the Bible tells us to be strong. And verse 11 says, And to put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. The people that rule this world are working hard in making their reset because they want to change to their new dispensation. And they're doing that. And uh, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 13. Look at how many times we see the word stand. Verse 11. Stand. Verse 13. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. Verse 14. Stand therefore. Do <laughs> um, you think God wants us to stand or do you think God wants us to fall away? No. We that are true Christians, we need to stand. We need to say, you know, I don't want to be one of those apostates. I want to stick with what the Bible says, even though the whole world seems to be falling away from what the Bible says. Verse 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now that's what it's all about for today, the gospel. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Verse 16, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And so it's all about the gospel, verse 19. So what is the gospel? Well, I'm glad you asked. The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And the gospel is all about salvation by faith. Faith in the gospel. And you know what's interesting? When we go to the passage that's known as the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, guess what it says? <laughs> In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, it says, stand. Hmm. A lot of people today that claim to be Christians, they don't even know what the gospel is or where it's found in the Bible. But the Bible says we're to stand in the gospel. And it's the gospel of the blood atonement of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Are you standing in the gospel? Are you trusting the gospel? Do you have faith in the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel is all about what Jesus did to save us. Don't make the mistake that Israel did and reject the Messiah. Trust in the Messiah and stand in him and what he did for you. And then he'll take you up at the rapture so you can escape what's coming. You know, a lot of these dispensations, it's all about escaping. Um, what happened here? Well, they, they were turning from God and they were in captivity, but then came Moses and God's judgment fell on Egypt and Israel escaped. So you don't have to be under the judgment of God. You can escape it if you stand in what God said to stand in. So this is the gospel and wherein you stand. Verse 2 says, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Vain is self, vanity. Um, are you trusting in what you did? Or are you trusting in what Jesus did? Salvation today is not what we do. We can't save ourselves. Salvation is trusting in what Jesus did. What did he do? Well, verse 3 says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Notice what it says. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to Scripture. So the Gospel is not just the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's how he died for our sins. So are you trusting in that? Are you trusting in that blood? You see, how did he die? He died by shedding his blood. And the Bible tells us that it's the blood atonement of Jesus that saves us. And you need to stand in that. A lot of churches today, they don't preach the gospel. They don't preach the blood atonement of Christ. They are not standing. It makes me wonder if they're even saved. That's a shame. So if you are a true Christian, are you standing in the gospel of the finished work of Jesus Christ and his blood atonement? Are you preaching that? Are you teaching that? Are you telling others that? Because that's the only hope of salvation, through the blood of Jesus Christ. So this is this age that we're in, the church age. We are in this dispensation, and it's almost over. The world is planning their reset, and I think the world knows that the rapture's coming, and so they're like, we're going to get the world after these Christians leave, so here's our plan, we're going to do this, this, and this. That's what they call the Great Reek said, and believe it or not, it has to do with the economy, what they're planning. They have a, an economic plan for the world, they have a religious plan, they have an educational plan, they have a banking plan, they have this thing all planned out for when they take over. 
That's their great reset. But for a Christian, guess what our great reset is? The rapture. Because the Bible says God goes, reset for me. And even though I'm in a fallen, fleshly uh, nature that will die someday, God says, I'll give you a glorified body. I will take you up to heaven and give you a new body. And that's at the rapture. And boy, I get to start all over again in a body that can't die. That's my reset. That's awesome. That's called the rapture. And since we're in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, let's look at a passage that speaks about the rapture. This is the Christian's great reset. Amen? The rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. There's my reset. I change. Woohoo! I'm changed to my glorified body. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're saved, you have the victory. And this is your escape from what's coming in this world. What's coming? We'll read the book of Revelation. And look at all the cups and the bowls and the vials and the, uh, the thunders and, and, and how God pours out His wrath upon this earth during the tribulation period. But now look at verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be steadfast and unmovable. Well, that sounds like stand. <laughs> if you are a Christian, you should be standing for the truth, even though we live in a world of many who do not. Sadly, in the world we live in today, many people who claim to be Christians have turned from the truth. They're not preaching the true gospel of salvation. And that's sad. I want to be a true Christian, not a, a name only or a word mouth only Christian. I'm a Christian because I believe with all my heart and I stand in what the Bible says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18, is another passage in the Bible about the rapture. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, we read, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. This is those who have died as Christians. Their soul went to heaven, but their body is in the grave, sleeping. And at the rapture, their body will rise, and their soul will come down, and they'll be given a glorified body. Like we read in 1 Corinthians 15, the corruption shall put on incorruption, and they shall have a glorified body for all eternity. That's the great reset for the Christian. So it says here in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. He brings their soul down from heaven, and their body is asleep in the grave. Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Verse 16, The rapture, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's a comfort to know that I'm going at the rapture. And I don't have to be under this new system of the Antichrist. But the world today is talking about their great reset. If I remember right, I think it was the World Economic Forum um, that I looked up and some other things. And they're talking about the Great Reset Initiative. That's their term for it. And it's their desire to bring about a global one world government with a one world banking system. A lot of people think this will be blockchain or uh, cyber currency and things like that, and it very well could be. But you know, the Bible tells us about this. When we started out, I read verses on how God from the beginning tells you about how it's going to be in the end. Well, we see the devil in all of these dispensations trying to bring about his plan. And God doesn't always allow it. <laughs> and uh, God overthrows his plan from time to time. But guess what? This is the dispensation, the tribulation period, in which God goes, Devil, I'm going to let you do whatever you want, okay? But just know, I'm not going to allow it forever. I'm coming back, and I'm going to take you out. 
So this is when the devil takes over the world, and he's going to set up his own system. Let's, let's just go ahead and for fun, let's go read Revelation chapter 13. We'll read this. It says in verse 1, we'll just go ahead and read verse 1 all the way down to verse 18, and see what the world would be like according to the Bible. They're calling it the Great Reset, and in their mind, it's a wonderful thing because everyone is going to all be the same and all have the same economic system. But is it a great thing? You see, if you go against it, then you're beheaded. <laughs> so it's kind of like a little bully system where they bully you into, now this is the way we're going to do it, and you follow what we say or else. Uh, that doesn't sound a lot like freedom or grace. You see, this is the church age time of liberty and grace. It doesn't sound like there's much liberty over here because this is the devil's system. Revelation 13, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. Well, the dragon is the devil. So the devil is giving authority to a beast, to a person, if you will. And he's allowing that person to take over the entire world. Now verse 3, And I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. So the whole world is worshipping Satan, the dragon. So Christians are not welcome in this world. <laughs> so the great reset is get rid of God and the Bible so we can set up our system in which we worship Satan or Lucifer, the dragon. You say, why do you keep calling him the dragon? Well, verse 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. So the dragon is the devil, Satan. That's actually in chapter 12. It was across the page over here. Uh, that was Revelation 12, 9. And so it tells you who the dragon is. Now back to chapter 13. And it says here, uh, verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? So he's a very powerful person who must have many, many, many soldiers and, and um, war uh, machines. And he must be able to have, I guess, the greatest army in the world. And no one will be able to defeat him during that time. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now, some people try to say that's us. But we who are saved today, we are saints, and we go up in heaven. But the Bible talks about tribulation saints, and those are those who say no to this Antichrist and his system, to his great reset. And they say, no, we don't want to do it your way. They are beheaded. So I think this is who the saints are that he overcomes. These are the, those who didn't go at the rapture. And then they say, man, maybe I should have been a Christian. You know what? I choose Jesus. And he says, no, there's no Jesus here. Not in our dispensation. No, you have to trust me. And you have to worship me and the dragon. And if you say, no, I choose Jesus, then you're beheaded. And you're overcome, it says. And, and he will kill those who claim to be Christians. So there will be a worldwide massive murder of people who in the tribulation period say, I decide to be a follower of Jesus. And they say, no, we will not allow that. And they will kill those people. How sad. How sad that is. And so power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So he takes over the entire world, this antichrist person, this beast. Verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. So no one else is allowed who believes in some other God. Only he is God. And who are these people that are worshiping him? whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So they're lost. If you choose the Antichrist, you are lost, because you rejected the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Verse 9, if any man have an ear, let him hear. Well, I'm telling you, because I want you to hear what the Bible says is going to take place after this great reset. Because the great reset is to all bring about this kingdom. And this is what the Bible says. Verse 10, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. 
So these are the saints in that time, the tribulation saints, those who miss the rapture and then go, oh, that Jesus guy was right, and those Christians were right. Man, I should have listened. Well, all right, I'm going to take up a sword, and I'm going to fight the Antichrist. And guess what? They are killed with a sword. The Antichrist defeats them. So if you miss the rapture, the last thing you need to do is fight the Antichrist, okay? <laughs> because you will not win. That's what the Bible says. Um, best thing to do, the Bible says, endure to the end. So go hide somewhere, I guess, and try to live until the end of this period. But there's no guarantee that you'll live because the Bible says that a third of the uh, uh, forest will burn down and a third of the waters will turn to blood. And isn't it a third of the people will die? And so there'll be a lot of death. There'll be a lot of destruction. There'll be earthquakes. There's no guarantee that you'll even make it through this time period. It's, it's a horrible time. That's why it's so good to be saved in the age of grace and go at the rapture. Now, verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Wow, so he's like doing some things that make people go, Wow, he must be a god. Well, way back in the Old a testament the Romans took over and the Caesar said I am God and people had to worship him as God and guess what many Christians said I can't do that and guess what they were killed the uh, persecution of Rome against Christians was brutal and if you study history you see that and so verse 14 and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live Verse 15, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Capital punishment for not being politically correct. Capital punishment for not worshiping this beast that is, well, it's literally Satan incarnate, I believe. It's called the man of sin. It's called the son of perdition. Well, uh, Judas was the son of perdition. The Bible says the devil entered into him. So if you read and you connect the dots and put this all together, the devil is going to be inside of him. And the devil is demanding the world worship him under penalty of death. Verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Three parts to what we call the mark of the beast. So I'll just abbreviate that here. The mark of the beast. So do you see how his goal is to take over the entire economy? And when he takes it over, he says, now, if you want to buy, and you want to sell, if you want to have a right to practice a free enterprise economy... <laughs> then you have to take our mark. What is a mark? Well, isn't that what you put on cattle when they belong to you? If you're a rancher, what do you do? You have your mark. And uh, usually it's a, it's a letter or a number or something, and you put that in the fire and you go, and you burn that into the side of the cattle, and anyone that sees that cow, they go, oh, that belongs to so-and-so. That's his mark. So the devil is literally marking people, and he's claiming ownership of them. And he's saying, you belong to me. And if you say, no, I don't, he says, then I will kill you. Because I am absolute dictator over the entire world. That's kind of scary, isn't it? <laughs> I'm so thankful that I get out before the Great Reset, because this is my reset, the rapture. I am going up. Amen? Like somebody says to me sometimes, calls me on the phone, they say, Brother Breaker, we're going vertical. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to going vertical. Amen? Another guy calls and he goes, Brother Breaker, we're going to be off planet soon. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, well, I'm going to leave here soon at the rapture. I'll be off planet. Amen? I'll be in heaven. But it says here, again, verse 17, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now verse 18 says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred, threescore, and six. So the number of the beast somehow is six, six, six. And that is going to be what happens in that dispensation. 
Now, let's go over to 2 Thessalonians. I just want to show you some things in the Bible about the future. And I wish it was a happy future, <laughs> but it's not. The future looks pretty grim according to the Bible. But this is what the Bible teaches. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Look what it says is going to take place during this time. All right, This is obviously the tribulation period, the dispensation of, of this tribulation, if you will. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, we read, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, not only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. A lot of people say that's the, the, the Holy Spirit, and that the Antichrist can't do anything until the Holy Spirit takes us up. So the great race that can't happen, and this mark of the beast can't happen until the rapture, because God won't let it until he takes out his bride, the church. And so it continues here, and it says, verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Well, when is that? That's here in Armageddon, so that's seven years later. So eventually, judgment will fall. But for seven years, that Antichrist will get his way. And look what it says here about the Antichrist, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. We read about that in Revelation 13. He has power to call down fire from heaven. And he has wonders and miracles. But they're called lying wonders. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. These people that are in the tribulation didn't love the Bible, the truth. They didn't get saved, so they didn't leave at the rapture. So they're left behind. Now, left behind, are they going to get saved? Well, look what it says next. Verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. There will be a great lie that many people in the world believe. And it's not God lying. No, it's God allowing a lie to be propagated all over the world that people will believe. And I've always wondered, I wonder what this lie is. But these people, because they don't want to believe the truth, the Bible, they want to believe a lie. God says, well, go ahead. Go ahead and believe your lie. Why is it they believe the lie? Well, verse uh, 12 says that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They love sin more than they love righteousness, God in the Bible. So because they love sin, they didn't want righteousness or God or the Bible. So they chose sin and they chose evil. And God goes, okay, well, good luck with that. Bye. Go off in that direction and there's going to be a lie propagated in the world that you'll believe because you love evil. And because you believe not the truth. Now, verse 13 says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So we, who are true Christians, we don't get into that. We are saved by the rapture. That's what the Bible teaches. Verse 14 Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Look at verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand. <laughs> I'm a Christian, and I'm in this dispensation. I'm not over here. I'm going to stand in what the Bible says, because I'm looking up for my way out. I'm not looking, oh no, what do I do when I get into this? Because I read my Bible, and I don't see how, as a Christian, I could get into that. But look what he says there. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by epistle. So... We are supposed to stand in the truth. So the devil's going to come, and the devil's going to be bringing in lying wonders, verse 9. And there's going to be a great lie that he propagates through the world. And I've always wondered what that is. But do you, do you realize the devil is a liar? It's hard to know what the truth is nowadays when you listen to, well, anything. Because there's so many lies being spread. Matter of fact, um... Paul tells us this in the last days, 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now look what it says, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In these last days in which we live, there are going to be a lot of lies told. And we're seeing those lies daily. And who is propagating these lies? Well, the devil. 
John 8, 44 says, You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So all those who are following the dragon, they get in power by their lies. They're not telling the truth. They're not honest. They're lying. And the devil comes in lying. So lying and lies will be the theme of these last days. And we are seeing that today. It's very hard to believe anything that people say, especially lost people. So we know all this if we know the Bible. So the question is, what are we to do? Well, I'll close with that. That's a good question. As a Christian, I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to preach the book. I'm supposed to preach the Bible. So that's what I do. I come to you and I say, look what's happening in the world. Did you know it's all right here and it already told us that this is going to happen? That strengthens my faith in the Bible because it's all coming to pass just like the Bible said. So that helps me to know the Bible is true. So I better get in the Bible. I better read it and I better believe it. And I better put my faith in the blood of Christ. And I have. And I better encourage you, hey, get saved and go at the rapture. Otherwise, this is the future you have to look forward to a very dystopian future, a very sad future. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 15 tells us what we're to do, we who are saved. Titus 2, 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. We're in the age of grace, and we've been preaching grace. Verse 12, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world. So that's what I'm going to do as a Christian. I'm going to try to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I'm not going to follow the wickedness. I'm not going to jump on the bandwagon of the lies. I'm just going to stick with the truth. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So I'm living daily, telling people truth instead of lies, and I'm looking for deliverance, looking for the rapture. For my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. I'm supposed to stay away from iniquity. When I'm saved, my sins were washed away. And God wants me to live a pure life. So I'm going to do my best to stay pure, both spiritually and physically. Okay? And then it says in verse 15, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So I am supposed to stand and I am supposed to speak. Now is not the time to remain silent. Now is the time to tell the world, Hey, guess what? Everything you're seeing that's coming to pass is all prophesied in the Bible. And if you just read your Bible and knew your history, you would see every dispensation ends in people falling into sin. And guess what? That's where we are today. We're at the end of the age of grace. And everyone has fallen into sin. And boy, it's going to be really bad. You better be saved. Are you saved? Let's close with James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Now is not the time to go do sin and evil and wickedness and lie and cheat and steal. Now is the time to get right. Get right with God and get saved. James chapter 5, verse 7 through 12. James 5, 7, be, be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. All right, so I'm waiting. I'm being very patient. Lord, where are you? <laughs> Anytime. Be patient, therefore, brother, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. I truly believe that Jesus is coming soon. If you're not saved, sure in the world you're going to wake up one day, and it's going to be all over the news. People all over the world suddenly vanished, and we don't know where they went. In the back of your mind, just remember, some guy named Robert Breaker, me, told you that that was coming. And then you'll know what happened, and then you'll know what's coming to pass. And then it'll be too late to go at the rapture. Now you'll have to have your head cut off for Jesus if you choose Jesus rather than the devil. But in James chapter 5, look at um, verse 9. See, verse 8 says, For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Verse 9, Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. 
And it says in verse 11, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. What a merciful God we have. But above all these things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Every dispensation they fall. Are you saved? Are you a Christian? Well, if you're a Christian, don't fall into apostasy. Don't backslide into sin. Don't accept the lies. Look for the truth. You can't lose your salvation if you're saved, but you can sure lose your testimony. You can lose your joy. It says, happy are you. You're supposed to be happy. You can lose a lot of things. You can lose rewards in heaven. See, the judge, Jesus, is coming. He's the judge we just read there in verse 9. And at the rapture, when we go out, then is what is called the judgment seat of Christ. And that's where God judges us and gives us rewards for what we did for him. So are you doing anything for him? Are you trusting the Lord? Or have you fallen into sin? If you're living in sin, you need to hit the reset button in your life and come back to God and say, well, I'm not doing right as a Christian. Reset, 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 repent, I repent. I'm coming back to God. I'm going to do right because I want to lay up treasures in heaven. I want some rewards. So I'm going to do everything I can to stand and I'm going to do everything I can to speak and say what the Bible says and preach that gospel of salvation. Because I want to see people get saved. I don't want to see anybody go downstairs to that place of torment. I don't want to see anybody go into the tribulation and be branded like cattle and belong to the devil and be forced to worship him. I don't want that. I want you to see that Jesus Christ is God. And he died in your place for your sins. Don't make the mistake that Israel did and reject him. Come to him. Trust him. Trust that blood. And he will take you out from what it's about to happen in this world. There's much more that I could say, but I'll stop there. I hope this has been a blessing to you. And uh, I hope you'll heed this message. And I hope you will come to Jesus for salvation. And if you are saved, then I hope you will stand, and I hope you will go, and I hope you will witness to other people. Tell them what's coming. God bless you. We'll see you next time. If we're still here, if the rapture hadn't taken place, we'll see you next time with another sermon. God bless you. Bye-bye.